Well, Steve Clark, welcome to this one-to-one. -one. I'm absolutely delighted to get the chance to chat to you. Is it a job that you feel comfortable in now? Can you enjoy it? I don't think you ever... I think when you're a football manager or a football head coach, whatever your title is, it's always difficult. To, listen, there's always good moments. And it's what I've learned is it's important to enjoy the good moments because you know that there's going to be probably more bad moments than good moments. So do you enjoy it? Yeah, at times I enjoy it and at other times it's... It's like any other job, it's difficult. If you're a Scot, uh, I mean, I, I remember chatting to uh, one of your predecessors, Gordon Strachan, who said the pain at times of not being able to deliver what he wanted as a fan and a manager and a representative of the entire nation, it becomes difficult. Yeah, I, th I think you, you do feel that. You, you feel that pressure. You, you understand going into the big matches that the country wants to be successful. You also know that you want to be successful. You know that your players want to be successful. And, and sometimes you have to suffer. You know, if, if it doesn't go your way, you have to suffer. And it's important to suffer together. And then when the good moments come around, and, and thankfully in the, the last couple of years there's been, there's been some good moments, uh, we've enjoyed it. And we've enjoyed it as a nation, which is, it, to me is important. And when I was sitting next to you uh, a few years ago, there was a real sense of where are we going to get certain players? You know, there was a real a dearth of talent in certain areas mm -hmm. and then suddenly the jigsaw started to come together is that fair comment were you in those early years really worried thinking what am I going to do with what I have available I didn't really have time to think about being worried it was always like I'm always one can I find a solution you need to find solutions so you need to look where you are and everybody was going on at that time was I think maybe fullbacks was mentioned, no fullbacks, and then suddenly we've got hundreds of fullbacks. I, th I think the important, or some of the important additions were to get good forwards. I managed to persuade Lyndon to come, uh, which is good, but I, I didn't over persuade him. I, I, I left the conversation very open. He had to, he had to make the choice. I, I think everyone will agree it was was a good choice for us and, and a good choice for Lyndon. And then. She had been on the radar a little bit and it was, it was just about getting the timing right and, and making sure that she came and joined us. And Recently you've got Jacob Brown's come into the squad, suddenly Ross Stewart's gone down to England and started scoring a few goals. Uh, so, like everything else in football, Peter, things can go in cycles and, and you might not see something coming, for good or bad, and then suddenly it's there in front of you. And then you have to, you have to maximise the, the moment, really. And then, of course, everybody's got an opinion. I've never. I, 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 it's the one job where everybody wants to tell you who's a player and who should be in the squad. You know, there's that kind of a parochial attitude of teams. What you know, a one team city, for example, like Aberdeen, and they yeah. think their players should be in, and all of a sudden you're behind the eight ball again. Well, I think that comes with that comes with the job. I, I'm not. A, I'm not a silly wee boy for Sulkets. I'm, I'm quite sensible. I knew when I took the job that you you open yourself up to. The fact that everybody wants to pick the national squad, everybody wants to pick the team, but I'm the lucky one. I'm the guy that does get to pick the squad, and I'm the guy that does get to pick the team. So I always look at it and say, I respect everyone can have an opinion, but ultimately I've got to get the opinion right. I've got to get my opinion right, and hopefully pick the right squad and the right team. Did you have a preconceived idea? <coughs> excuse me, of the way you wanted them to play, or uh, I can remember um, uh, Marcello Lippi at a conference at Largs with all the managers, and so many of them said to us that when they asked him what style of play is Marcello Lippi famous for, and he said, whatever players I have available, if it's a tall guy, then I'll get the ball forward quickly. Did you have a preconceived idea, or were you, were you just saying to yourself, look, I understand what I have, this is the way we're going to have to set up until such times as it changes? I think you go into any job and you assess what you've got, you assess the players that you have. Uh, listen, Lippy's a top coach and, and what he said there is correct. You, if, you've got good, if you've got two good forwards, you might as well play them both. So if you've, if you've gone with a preconceived idea that you're going to play one striker and two wingers and you've got two good forwards, then you, you're not playing your best players. I think the, the job of a manager or a head coach is to give whichever group of players they've got the best possible chance to win that game of football. And whether that can be, obviously when I was at Kilmarnock, everyone so, thought that we were quite negative and, and would sit in and play on a counter-attack. But, but that's the players that I had at that time. And then you, you come into the national job and I tried to make us hard to beat to start with. 
reasonably successfully. Although in the first few months there was there was some scutcheons, <laughs> but you're learning all your time. You know, as, as you look at those games, you think, okay, we need to improve in certain areas, and that was ultimately how I, I decided to go with the, the three central defenders, uh, and that's worked quite well for us. But it's also there's a little hybrid of the three central defenders because and Scott McTominay is plays in midfield for Manchester United. You know, you've got Grant Hanley who's proper head it and kick it centre half, and then. We've been using Kieran as a as an inside fullback, if you like, and it, that worked well for us. Uh, obviously, the game's coming up; we we won't have Kieran, uh, and I'll have to tweak it again. I'll have to find a slightly different dynamic to that three. Do you like a Do you like a ball player coming out from the centre half position? I think if you're going to, if you look at modern football, and probably going back to a time when Sir Alex was at, at Manchester United, and they, they couldn't quite find a a solution to their problems in Europe. And I think Alex looked at it and he was playing 4-4-2, so only two midfield players in the middle. And he, and he as, as you would expect from Sir Alex, he, he decided he needed three midfield players in the middle. And suddenly, Manchester United were competitive in Europe. And you always look and trying to work the best way forward. So you're always looking to try and get that edge, get your team that little bit better. How, how much of a bonus was it for you as things were developing that suddenly you have in that midfield, you know, two real powerhouses. McGinn, um, and, you know, you might disagree with me, but this year, for me, McGregor has been the best midfielder in Scotland. I mean, he's just he's just incredible with his with his passing, his link-up. And then, of course, you've got a Gilmer or someone else. That's probably why Callum got <laughs> player of the year this year, because he, he was outstanding. Uh, he's always been good. I've, I've always enjoyed working with Callum. Uh, John McGinn... Obviously, catch, catches a lot of the headlines because he scores goals, uh, and he's done great for us. But I, th I think the you now whether we got there by luck or good judgment, I'll leave I'll leave for other people to decide. <laughs> but suddenly you end up with a, a midfield where you've got Callum McGregor and Billy Gilmore, and suddenly for a for a Scottish national team, we had a team that could control the ball a little bit and, and play and, and get people breaking in. You've got. Scott McTominay coming out for the back, Kieran Tierney, and suddenly we had a different dynamic to the team. Now, I'll leave it to other people to think well, it was good judgment or, or a little bit of luck, but that improved us as a team. I think it's, it's improved us as a team. And obviously you've got good backup players be that, behind that. Kenny McLean always came in and did a good job for us in midfield. We've got Ryan Jack back. Don't forget Ryan Jack and Callum McGregor in the playoff game against Serbia. For me, was the very important part of the team that, that won the game that night. They, they, were, they were outstanding in midfield, uh, along with John McGinn, who ran himself into the ground, as he always does. Yeah, I, I was wondering, who do you think's get the, who do you think's get the bigger arse, John McGinn or Kenny Dalglish? I thought you were going to say John McGinn or you. <laughs> you by a mile. <laughs> I'll, run, I'll run him close. <laughs> Although John's touch on his right foot's not as good. Anyway, <laughs> apart from that, I mean, the, it, that's the great thing about it. We, I watched... You know, in awe of the previous games, the last few games, Scotland have scored goals, which is all about, you know, good passing, great technical ability, and a finish to match. It is a, it's a team that's evolving. Uh, I think I said that before we went to the Euros. So I'm, go I'm going to take a little bit of credit for this because I said, look, we'll get the chance to work together for close on a month. And this group of players will come out of the Euros. No matter how we do in the Euros, we'll come out of the Euros and be a better group of players. And that came to pass. I mean, obviously, the first game was after the Euros was a difficult game away to Denmark. We had so many, was was the worst build-up ever. There's so many COVID issues and injury problems. And we went there and we, we weren't quite at it. Since then, eight games unbeaten. So I, I think I was right in the fact that the Euros, the experience of being in a tournament together and working together has improved us as a, as a squad and as a team, yeah. which, which is really important for us. And I know some people are saying, oh, you know, it's great, you've got the squad back together and you're looking and thinking, I've got, I've got three days with them. But do you now have a situation where the boys go away and you've got that nucleus who know that they're coming back to play a certain way? It's not, it's not club management, but you've got them in a zone where yeah, they know you what you the, expect. What you have is you have the continuity. So when they come back, they probably... It's great because they come back and immediately you can see all the little friendships that have developed over the, over the past three years. And you can see that they enjoy being together. And then you go to the training pitch and you're saying, I'm going to tell them this, this and this today. And then suddenly the training session's gone on, you're thinking, 
I don't need to tell them, they've already got it. They know how to play, they know, they know what to expect from ourselves as a team. My job with the rest of the coaches is to give them little bits of information about the opposition, so how we have to adapt slightly to, to deal with this problem or how we have to adapt slightly to deal with that problem or what we can do to cause them a problem. But by and large, the, the makeup and the shape, they, they understand immediately what we want. Would you have tweaked anything in the, in the Euros that didn't go according to plan? Yeah, I think we'd. Have, I think when the Czech Republic game was nil nil, we had a we had a one chance in the first half. If we had scored first in the game, it changes the whole dynamic. Uh, we had a couple of chances early in the second half, before the the wonder goal. And no matter what anybody says, that was a wonder goal. You yeah. don't see you don't see too many goals like that. Uh, if we'd got the game one one, I, I think we'd have, we'd have got something out of the game. So. It was a game of football that didn't go our way. You know, people will say, oh, we didn't play well, or we didn't do this, or, or the manager got the team selection wrong, which is, which is correct. Everybody can say that, no problem. But what happened was it was a game of football that didn't go our way. And sometimes that happens as well, and you've just got to take it on the chin. The middle game against England was, was a good performance. I think most people would agree with that. Uh, I see a lot of people saying we could have won the game, but it was good to go to Wembley and, and, and perform as we did. Unfortunately, I think we emptied the tank a little bit there and we didn't quite have enough for the final game. But we'll learn from that. Hopefully we'll learn from that going into the next, the next tournament that we, we qualify for. Just picking up on that point, do you feel as if maybe they all get caught up in you know, this whole emotion of, of Wembley, the old enemy well, you, and all that? You've, you've got that. Uh, I think you've got a lot, a lot of the boys that are playing down in England that, that go there and think, well, I don't want to listen. I don't want to suffer listening to the English boys batter me next year because they, they beat us at Wembley in the tournament. So you, you've got that element. Plus, to give ourselves a realistic chance of coming out of the group, we needed to get something out of the game. We had to go to the last game with something to say, right, come on, if we, if we win the last game, we're, we're, go we're definitely going through. So all those factors together made it a, a night where we left everything on the pitch. And unfortunately, we didn't recover quite to where we should have been for the last game. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because yet again you're faced with another set of emotions that you obviously will have to, or do you have to emphasise to the players that all that noise around Ukraine and, and, and the real sympathy and the groundswell of, you know, opinion about Ukraine's situation, you have to try and, do you have to try and temper that with the players by saying, look, you've got to take that emotion out of it? No, listen, we, we have to respect everything that goes on round about the, the situation in Ukraine and, and we've already done that. We played the friendly match against Poland. We, we raised a lot of money to, to send and try and help. Obviously, it's a drop in the ocean in, in terms of what needs to happen there. They will be emotional. They, they will be desperate to give their country a boost and go to the World Cup finals, but it's a game of football and we also want to go to Qatar. We've waited a long time to put ourselves in this position. We've worked hard to put ourselves in this position and I know that the players are desperate to go there. So, uh, taking all that away, you, you look at the game of football, it's a very good Ukrainian team playing against a very good Scotland team. And I think it'll be a good match. And like I said before, hopefully the football gods are on our side and we, we manage to get to Qatar because, or manage to get to play the Welsh, which is the next step. We've still got two steps to go. Uh, but the... I think the outside influence finishes once the game starts. Yeah, just a few questions before we finish. Was there a, was there a moment, did you have any discussion that was, look, this game's not going to happen or do Scotland do some kind of honourable thing? Oh, we did, listen, we did everything that we could. We cancelled the game immediately. Obviously, you, you do what we can. We, we did everything we could to get in a position where Ukraine could get a team on the pitch. And fortunately, that's what's happened. They'll be well prepared and we'll be well prepared for hopefully a, a good competitive match. Yeah, and now that you've got a, a team that's going and fighting in the same direction, um, you know, was there a moment or a line in the sand somewhere where suddenly you sensed every player wants to be involved? Because I looked at, I look at everybody making themselves available and then, you know, every now and then you get a, you know, the, the boy Richie and then you get a Ryan Fraser who suddenly doesn't trap and that kind of sets me back and I think to myself being cynical come on you can't pick and choose your games I think it's just a, it's just a gradual process for a, obviously the, the more the players enjoy coming to the camp the better because for me a happy player is a good player uh, 
And then you'll always, listen, you'll always have people who, who want to come in and play. And if they're not playing, they're never going to be that happy. But if you can get them to buy into the philosophy and where we're trying to go as a team and as a squad and as a country, then, then hopefully you'll get, you'll get more that want to come than more that don't want to come. And at the moment, we're in a really good place in terms of the boys want to be here, the boys that I'm picking want to be here and they want to be competitive and they want to do well for their country. And that's a great place to be. Yeah, and, and coming through, you've got a really good batch of players. Nearly all of the jigsaw looks really good. There's players that want to come in and help. You mentioned Kenny McLean, if somebody drops out. Um, do you see another batch? I'm looking at Lowry, uh, you know, for Rangers. I think he could develop next year. Are there other players there? No, that there's, 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 some young, there's some young ones that, that we have to give time to develop. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at the age group of this current squad, I'm thinking, OK, Qatar 2022, uh, I think it's Germany 2024, and the next World Cup 2026. Th this current group of players outside, maybe, obviously Craig will keep going because Craig's Peter Pan. <laughs> he he'll play he's 50. Grant Hanley's 30, Liam Cooper 30. But the rest can be ready for all those tournaments as well. So that gives the, the next group a little bit of time to find their, their level, play for their clubs regular. You mentioned some of the younger ones at Rangers that are in and around the team just now, but they're not playing all the time. You know, they're in and around it. You have to give these boys time to develop and hopefully in three or four years time, that's the next generation that's coming through. And do you think with Rangers reaching the Europa League with Celtic and their transformation, do you are you filled with optimism about the likes of a, a Hearts, maybe Hibs or Aberdeen if they get their act together, you know, that there could be I think a, a Scottish, strong I think Scottish, Scottish football. Is in a, I think it's in a good place. Yeah. I think it was fantastic what Rangers did to get to a, a European final uh, in this day and age when other countries have got really good teams, really big budgets. No English teams in the Europa League. Eh? All out, West Ham out in the semi-final, but Rangers got to the final. It's a big step forward. Celtic have improved a lot under Postacoglu and, and I'm sure that they'll, they'll look to improve again because... Their European record hasn't been great, so they'll, they'll want to do well in the Champions League. Hearts, straight into Europa League group stage. Now, the players that are going to play in that group stage are going to get at least minimum six games. They can only improve. You're playing against good players, good teams all the time. You can only get better. So it's great for Scottish football. OK, you're filling me full of optimism now. This is, this is the most optimistic I've been in your company before. Brilliant. Um So, with that in mind, you, you said to me you've got, you've got two or three good players in a position. So, Lyndon Dyke, Shea Adams, it's two strikers up front and it's let's go and have a go at Ukraine. Or maybe one up front. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> what would it mean to you to Steve? No, but if you, you look, if you look at the last game, we didn't have Lyndon because he was injured. Yeah. And Shea played up on his own. Well, he didn't play on his own because John McGinn was always there and Ryan Christie was always there. One of the midfield players was always there. The full were always there. So we're, we're, we're in a good shape. Yeah, tell me, does Steve Clark go back into a room on his own and dream, oh, God, what we can get to Qatar? Do you do it like a fan, like us, all of us who think, come on, let's go? And I go into my room and I wait on the phone ringing with the next problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, right, I need to deal with that one. Okay. Now, listen, I'm, I'm like everybody else. I want to... One of my ambitions would be to go to a World Cup with my country. Uh, I didn't manage to do it as a player. I got close, but I didn't quite do it. So I need to do it as a coach. Yeah, fingers crossed you do. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter. Talk Thank long. you.